Good evening and welcome to the Ordinance Review Committee meeting November 30th, 2020. This meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. First on our agenda, roll call, Laura, please. Sure. Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Thorpe. Here. Member Peck. Here. And Member Napolitano. It's not the way. I know we've dinner. seen him. He's so, I think. We know he'll be here momentarily, so. Okay. Is he? <clears throat> now, I'll just say he wasn't present on roll call, but arrived shortly thereafter. Okay. So I'll just go to next on the public comments. So we will begin as always with public comment. <clears throat> if you know you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. To raise your hand, you click on participants in the horizontal menu bar at the bottom of the screen. A column will open with the participants of the meeting. The raise hand feature is at the bottom of the column. If you are calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, you may use the chat feature to send a message to me. I will do my best to monitor that for people having technical difficulties, but that is the only purpose for which we will use that function. It will only be used during public comment. I will unmute each raised hand one by one and ask if you would like to make a comment. When you begin, please state your name and your city or town for public record. We do not respond during public comment as it is your time to speak. So while your comments should be directed to us, you will understand when we don't respond. Due to the size of the meeting that it is public and how remote participation works, all participants will need to be muted until called upon. I also ask that all but the committee members turn off your video until called upon as comments are directed to the committee members and only the person recognized has the floor. We will also do our best to act quickly if someone is clearly acting in a way that is inappropriate. I will remind people that we are always happy to receive comments by email, which are equally part of the public record. So please email us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. Thank you. So uh, anyone for public comment? I see Razi Barrison share. Yep, hi. Um, so I just wanted to speak today in support of some points that were highlighted by um, Tay at the last meeting that I was unable to make it to. Um, I think that during the this um, ordinance review, it's vitally important that the um, council review several ordinances and also consider creating new ones that affect um, our unhoused neighbors in the city of Northampton um, who are currently facing unlivable conditions due to a combination of the pandemic, the Massachusetts winter and the entire bureaucracy that is um, set up to make it difficult for them to obtain housing, healthcare and basic resources. Um, so the main points are just that, um, well, in terms of ordinances that need review, um, I would like to suggest that the council review um, all ordinances surrounding camping um, and repeal the ban on temporary structures because oftentimes people don't have anywhere else to stay and need a roof over their heads. Um, and additionally, um, Northampton currently criminalizes panhandling without a permit and that is often the only way that people are able to make an income. And it's really vital that um, that not be banned because otherwise people can't afford basic necessities like, um, you know, food and uh, rent. Um, additionally, Northampton currently does have a ban the box law um, for job applications, but it has not taken many steps to enforce that law. Um, and we also think, or following what unhoused organizers in our city have requested, there should be a similar law pertaining to um, housing applications. And then finally, um, I'd like to suggest that the council consider um, passing an ordinance that bans the selling of public lands to private developers by the city and additionally pass an ordinance that incentivizes against um, maintaining uh, landlords who maintain 
vacant private properties because those properties can be made into affordable housing and it isn't fair that there are um you know hundreds of people living on the streets while there are even more properties that currently sit vacant so um that was what i wanted to bring up thank you so much for the opportunity to talk thank you and could you state the uh, city or town you're from no problem i'm from northampton thank you next up uh, we have bo c Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, my name is Bo Clark. I currently live in Hadley, but I was born and raised in Northampton. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you today to um, the same, you know, I'd like to echo Razi's sentiments and um, what Tay has wrote into y'all. I know that a lot of the ordinances that we're talking about have been brought to your attention. Um, and I just think that we have a really amazing opportunity in terms of like reviewing these ordinances and maybe figuring out ones that, you know, don't work anymore. And an opportunity to create new ones. Um, I know that this doesn't happen very often, so I think it's really important. And I, I'm really grateful that this is happening now during a pandemic because I feel like a lot of this has really brought like these conditions um, really into the light uh, and to a head. But um, I wanna say that the start with definitely the camping ordinances, I think all should be repealed um, or, you know, even writing a new ordinance, like, um, like I, I guess I, I push you to be creative um, if you think these things maybe aren't in your purview or, you know, like there's, you can always create new ordinances. Um, you know, like ones have been done with fee schedules that are sliding scale. Um, they, you could you could do ones that, you know, like maybe don't, uh, you know, these things cannot be enforced for um, someone who meets this criteria of being unhoused. Um, but the camping ordinances too, I wanted to talk about it. There's not, I know there's not one singular one, but the way that this has been used a lot is, um, folks are trespassed whenever, you know, like they want to clear unhoused people that are erecting tents and et cetera out. Um, so I think those, um, also I think the panhandling and soliciting ordinances, uh, many could just be repealed. Um, I've looked over a lot of those in, uh, what is it? Chapter 245. So especially the ones where it says that you, you can revoke the permits um, if a permit holder has any felony or crime involving moral turpitude. Um, so there's a lot there. Um, I think that Northampton should take steps to enforce the ban the box law. Uh, I know it's a Massachusetts law, but it's, you know, it's on a lot of applications asking about uh, applicants' criminal backgrounds. And I think there's a lot more we could do to actually make sure that's enforced. Um, I support a fair chance ordinance creating one that uh, limits private landlords' ability to consider criminal records when screening housing applicants. Um, this cre just creates another unnecessary barrier to housing access. Um, and I also support um, passing a ban uh, for selling public lands to private land developers when they are donated to the city. Um, so we don't end up with just more and more buildings that could be used for affordable housing being sold to big developers um, and also incentivizing against the um, keeping properties vacant. Um, but yeah, I just, I know that there, the charter is complicated and there's a lot of things that, I think there's a lot of opportunity here to create new ordinances and um, just like to be creative thinkers around like what we can do. You know, like I know Northampton's like a sanctuary city and I'll, you know, like there are, there are I think there are ordinances that, that we could come up with that would um, make sure that these things that are written in, into our charter can't affect unhoused folks. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Tay. Hi, I'm Tay. Um, yeah, I live in Hadley. I use they, them pronouns. And I am backing all of the things I have brought during the weeks and in the emails. Um, but I think the biggest thing I want to really highlight, I feel like if there's one thing that if I could like really fight for. And I've, and I've also, for all of these, I've gotten some emails back from the committee and I'm compiling a list of examples um, that I'll send your way as well to show that a lot of other cities have done this and that all of these ordinances as well are kind of just like the very first bare minimum first step to getting moving to where we need to go and are mostly about survival. 
um, and Northampton needs to care about the survival of unhoused people. Um, but I think I really want to just harp on the that we really, really need an ordinance that bans the selling of public lands to private developers, because I think a lot of the, the rest of the ordinances that are in here, I think, are great. The ones that are, have either been asked to be repealed or for new proposals, um, but they really will not matter if Northampton does not stop selling public lands that are gifted or received to private developers. We will not have affordable housing and that will never be a priority. It doesn't matter. It won't matter if we are able to. I'm weary of the ways in which um, if we're able to get private property vacancy, registrations, land banking, receiverships, eminent domains, I'm weary of the ability to do that and create an ordinance to do that. And then the city using that to an advantage and just again, selling it to private developers and just raising the rent and making, keeping Northampton unaffordable. Um, so I think that that demand needs to get met and that that is a thing that cities have done, but that cities often don't wanna give that one up um, because of profit. But we really, really, we again, just going back to this, we don't have water, we don't have public, access the public water in Northampton right now. We really need to be getting these basic things. We need to be putting money towards getting people the option to be housed if that's what they would like. Um, the rest, I'm going to just send a follow-up email on the examples of how to do some of these and the ordinances and some of the things we need to be careful of. But I think the other things that we need to just do are take out the many different ways that Northampton criminalizes people for existing and surviving in public, I think we need to really be adapting these ordinances or creating a whole, I'm thinking maybe not even repealing some of this in the way of that maybe we need a whole new ordinance that allows people to survive, allows unhoused people to survive without, so people do not have, will not be able to get arrested for trespassing. I think that there's a, there's a whole list of things that we can do to give people the right to exist um, in public. So yeah, that's it. Thanks. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, I see uh, Jose Adastra. Hi, my name's Jose. Thank you for your time. Um, I'd like to echo basically every, everything everyone before me has said. Um, and I would also like to frame this from as someone who used to live somewhere and then America came and said it was theirs now, um, as someone who was colonized, the government and in the past years selling public land to private companies, that that is a form of white supremacy and oppression. That is what the government's been doing for years to native people and people of color. So the more like that, that, and, and it's not even really covert um, either. And I'm, I'm really, um, I feel really adamantly that, that, that as a bare minimum ordinance, like that's a very simple thing with very little barriers. Stop, stop selling public land. Um, and start promoting, uh, you know, be because if we stop selling the public land, we have a chance to take the money that we're trying to reallocate now and, and funnel it into Black and Indigenous land stewardship, which will get people into their own small spaces. And as the others have been saying, I would like to see the ordinances be changed so that we can put people in little structures and, not, and and I know that people are pushing for a warming center, but if you look at a lot, so an alternative form of housing people with a very like high success rate, um, and I can send Councilor Kotzler uh, mm -hmm. a, a link of the article too. Um, you know, we, we're seeing in Seattle right now, they're doing like those Home Depot shit and they have heat and they have four walls and a lock on the door. Um, and that provides people that with the autonomy to be able to have privacy and actually rehabilitate, like recover or just 
transition and the success rates are high, but that is not, that's not happening here. If we keep selling private land to open, say a Starbucks or so the Coca-Cola company can expand, for example, or if we keep selling grammar schools to private companies, instead of making them schools or daycares for people, as we have been for the past couple of years, we're not, and it's not, we're not even creating housing, we're selling it to corporations. So that is one of the most white supremacist things you can do, especially when there's people on the street. Um, so I, I would just echo that we, that we edit the ordinances so that the people that we're trying to help, stop, they stop being arrested and patrolled every day because that is actually part of why they're so unstable emotionally is because they're treated like animals. So the sooner we can edit the ordinances so that we can actually have space that's allowed and that people aren't criminalized for either camping or if we wanted to build something, if we do have the resources, we could do it if we weren't being policed, you know? so. If the sooner we can edit it, the sooner it'll be easier for us to do what the government should have been doing to begin with. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And where you. city and town you're from? I'm from Northampton. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next up is Sid Ahrens. Just want to say that I agree with the comments that have been made today and I also want to add that I don't think being houseless should be a crime. And that seems to be how it's being treated in Northampton. And I think we can do a lot better. Thank you. I'm from Northampton. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Larkin Christie. Yeah. Um... I just wanna echo what everyone else is saying. I think it's really important in a city like Northampton where um, we have said we are a sanctuary city, um, are purporting to really push um, an leftist agenda in some ways, but um, are not taking care of our unhoused community members. That's like a really big um, mishandling of that situation. And I really encourage you all to look at the um, demands that Tay has written up for the unhoused community. Thank you. City and town where you're from? Waitley. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment that would like to speak? Seeing no other hands, public comment session is now closed. We will move on now to the approval of minutes of November 17th, 2020. Do I hear a motion for approval? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second it. I motion made by Jeff Napolitano. Oh, it's gonna be on the, it just, it's not, it's gonna be on the floor. I just wanted to acknowledge who is. So Jeff made the motion, I believe Marianne seconded it. So it is now open for discussion. Megan. I have some, I have some additions, if okay. I may. Okay. I take more than a few minutes, but I see that Nancy's not here yet. Um, so because last meeting, um, I had some audio issues. I just wanted to add a few things or make a few corrections. Mm -hmm. So page three, um, I think meant like speaking of education was past, asked if it's the eviction resources notice is under development right now by the planning department. And um, page four, um, I, I'd ask a question about whether or not this um, notification could also um, apply to where, whether landlords that do not use leases and just have informal arrangements 
could also um, would also have to comply with this notification. And um, page five. So my idea cut out for a little bit, but I, I think I wanted to add to what Jeff was saying about um, uh, you know people being most vulnerable when they don't know their rights and resources. Um, with this notification, um, you know, I, I had a conversation with um, Jason Cuddy of ServiceNet a few months ago, and he said that it was much um, it was much easier to assist people who um, may be anticipating eviction but were still housed. So, um, during this uh, thirty day period, um, you know, it would be possible for, if they reached out, it would be possible for them to um, for for organizations like ServiceNet that would be on this um, notification resource list to help um, uh, link them up with friendlier landlords. They um, also help them, you know, be placed into supportive programs, you know, um, while they still have um, jobs, income, savings, and address. Um, an eviction without before they have that you know eviction on their records. So, and um, and another correction is um, agree that education available and relatively low cost. They will have to understand the interactions with state law. I think it would make a little more sense. And. I think one more on page six. Um, so I wanted to add a little bit more to that portable screening report idea that was in the, the toolkit about the fair chance ordinance. Um, it would help uh, potential uh, we would help applicants bypass the rental agencies that control so much of the rental market here in Northampton. Um, they, this would allow them to like not perhaps pay their fees that constitute 50 or six to 60 percent of an entire month's rent. Um, these um, reports um, would give applicants the opportunity to review their um, their records um, and prepare mitigating evidence for any sort of criminal history that appears in that report prior to submitting their applications. And they could also, of course, use this with multiple landlords. Um, but this is one of those um, uh, digital platform remedies that um, Carmen Juno also mentioned when she talked to us um, about as a possible um, remedy for bypassing uh, the brokers. Anyway, that's that's all I have. So if I may, Vice Chair, is this stuff uh, all the all this all this that you just mentioned was were you clarifying this is what should have been added into did you already mention this at because the November 17th? I think that was a part that wasn't caught on audio. Right. Okay. Megan, I want to be sure. And if Megan, if you could just send me the text of the additions that you wanted to make to page five and six, I think I got pretty much the other ones, but not sure I got those in their entirety. Okay, sure. Of course. Right. Thanks. I'll make those changes. Okay. Then so should we wait on your approval? of the of these minutes till Laura makes those changes yep. because that I mean they seem pretty substantial and I'm really glad that I can hear your comments now Megan yes. <laughs> yeah. it was very frustrating key. Yes, it was and so um yeah so um that gee I made a motion again well, so 
Do I hear a second? Well, no, I, I, I already put this motion on the table to approve the minutes. So now I'm recommending that we uh, table this till next time. I'll second that. Okay. So we will reverse. But don't we have to vacate the, the have first to vacate. motion? Yes, you you know, motion. if you were just to withdraw the earlier motion, I will um, tell you that I'll put it on the agenda for next time for approval. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. so I, I would, I'm going to withdraw my motion to I approve the minute. Okay. Okay. And motion we don't need to vote on by, it now, right? Motion to withdraw right. by Councillor Nash and seconded by Councillor Labarge. And Councillor Labarge has her hand raised. Yes. Um, I want to echo with what Councillor Nash was talking about. I was a little confused with the minutes I'm hearing tonight because I didn't hear what you were talking about, Megan, last time on the minutes. So I find this a little hard for me to look at minutes that we received from Laura and we make a motion to approve it. And then you come in and you apparently, because none of us could hardly hear you, made some changes on it. So I, I just found it somewhat confusing with the minute parts tonight. So next meeting, you'll be able to see this in writing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, with additions. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's evident that Megan wasn't sure that Member Peck was not sure how much was actually coming through. And we were both we're all leaning up to our... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is understandable. This is a, this is a Zoom glitch, so... Yep. <laughs> So the approval minutes will be um, moved to the next meeting. It will not be addressed today, so it'll be tabled. Yeah. Thank you. Next up on the, on the agenda is the discussion of parking fines with parking administrator, Nancy Forrestal, who is here with us. Hello. Thank you for being here, Nancy. No problem. Welcome. Why oh. thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so we're hoping you can discuss with us some of the process regarding um, the fines, parking fines, how people get fined. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, I think Councilor Nash had brought it up the last time, uh, um, just having some questions around fines and people getting caught up with fines and parking fines and moving and, um, you know, not notifying uh, probably the registry of their new residence and their fines just keep growing and growing. And so I wonder if you can talk to us a little bit about the whole fine process, the parking fine. So I'm sure some of the members will have questions for you afterwards. Sure. So um, Northampton adopted um, Mass General Law um, 40, Section 20A and one half. And that's what we follow um, to set up our procedures and all that sort of stuff. Um, so if a person gets a ticket for a violation of a city ordinance, They have 21 days to pay or appeal that ticket. Um, if they want to appeal it, they have various options. They can go online, they can send something in, or when we were open to the public, um, they could come in to the office and fill out a form like that. That immediately puts the ticket on hold for 30 days so that the city hearing officer can review the ticket, review the circumstances, and make a decision as to whether or not to dismiss the ticket. Um, and then they have to reply to that individual within 21 days in writing. If the ticket is dismissed, it's voided, it's dismissed, it's all over with. I apologize, my cats want to join us here. Um, so, and if it's, um, if the appeal is denied, 
and the ticket stamp, um, then that person is given a new due date to pay the ticket. It stays on hold. So you're still at the original fine amount. It hasn't gone up. Um, and that person can then at that point request an administrative hearing and that would be in front of me. The ticket is put on hold until that hearing is scheduled. Um, and that could take a few weeks, depending upon the turnaround time. We hold hearings um, every Wednesday. And um, then I make a determination based upon what I see, what I've reviewed, um, and make a decision as to whether or not that ticket stands and or whether it would be dismissed. Um, that's the final decision at the city level. The person still has the right to, if they disagree with my response, my determination, um, they still have the right to request a judicial review and I provide them with the information at the beginning of every hearing, I go through all of this information. Um, they would have to contact Superior Court in Northampton um, through the clerk magistrate's office for Superior Court to get information on how to request a judicial review. And if, the, if they do in fact request a judicial review, then the ticket is put on hold until a determination has been made. Do you have any questions on that so far? So it's still at the original fee? At the original amount. Okay. Be it. Uh, you know, fifteen dollars, twenty-five dollars, um, a hundred dollars, hundred and fifty dollars, depending upon whatever the fine is. That's the violation. Is. is there a fee for them to file to ask to request a judicial review? Yes. What is that fee? Yes. Um, last time that I had any um, contact with that, it was um, three hundred dollars. How much? Three hundred dollars. If, if I may, Mr. Chair, that that issue has ta been taken to the SJC, and the SJC has rejected. Actually, the lawyer who did it is our a local lawyer here in Northampton. So Thank this, you. This is not a thing we can do about that. Thank you, Attorney yeah. Seawall. Uh, Councilor Lebard, looks yes. like. Um, Nancy, thank you for being here. Um, I have a question because we're talking about fines and violations and that. Sure. Okay, on sidewalks, we had serious problems with the Commission on Disabilities, which you probably know, um, occurring on King Street, the variety store next to the hotel. Right. Okay, yep. you know all about that. Phil Sullivan. With the delivery truck. Oh, big time. And right. Phil Sullivan submitted in to our Commission on Disabilities the pictures of the large trucks, mm -hmm. which took over the whole complete sidewalk. So anybody in a wheelchair did not have access at all, at all, right. of using that as a quality of life and going out in the road, which was even a dangerous situation. But anyways, Absolutely. it came to the fact that Apparently, the manager of the store was told that it was a violation, and he said he really didn't care about it. And anyways, they went higher up on that. I know Phil Sullivan went further with it also, but I also know that your department helped out, and we want to thank you for that, Nancy, and the police department. You're welcome. You're welcome. That is something that we make sure that the parking enforcement officers um, try and keep an eye on to make sure that we don't have, it, it's the delivery truck, particularly the ones that, you know, the large trucks coming in with the, with the big ramp that comes out of the back. Yep. You know, we have to watch those very closely because even if the truck, in this case, the truck is parking right on the sidewalk. Oh yeah. And in some cases, even if the truck isn't on the, on the sidewalk, by the time the ramp comes out, it may be obstructing the sidewalk. So that's the sort of thing that we try and keep a very close eye on. And when that's brought to our attention, like this case, um, that was uh, that was something that we wanted to make sure that we kept an eye on. Yeah, but thank you for all your help. You're, you're quite welcome. 
All right. So now if the person does not, if they want to just pay the ticket and not request an appeal or um, go through that process, then they have 21 days to pay that ticket. They have a lot of different ways that they can pay it. They can pay in person when we were open. In this case now, we have a secure drop box where payments can be left. Um, that's checked twice a day um, so that the payments can be um, um, you know, registered. And they can also pay it online. They can mail it in a payment either directly to our office or to our payment processing center. But they have that 21 day period. Um, if they don't do anything, there's no payment, there's no appeal requested. After that 21 days, a $10 late fee is added to the fine. And that's in accordance with Mass General Law. And then at that point, a late notice is sent out. That's automatically generated by our processing center. And that notice goes to the registered owner of the vehicle because the registered owner of the vehicle is ultimately responsible for that violation. Even if it was the granddaughter who was using grandma's car and gets the ticket and doesn't tell grandma anything about it, unfortunately, as the registered owner, she's the one who gets the late notice sent to her. And then that generates a phone call oftentimes to us to find out what's going on. And we provide that information. Um, that late notice also warns the individual that registry action could be taken if they don't pay the violation and the late fee at this point. If they, if they don't pay the amount that's on that late notice, that individual is warned that it could increase, it will increase in, in um, the fine amount and with the, with the penalty fees and that it could go to the registry of motor vehicles, at which point in accordance with Mass General Law, the registry will um, at that point place a $20 surcharge um, which is a registry surcharge onto, on top of what is already owed and the vehicle's registration and license um, could be marked for non-renewal. We, we don't just send out one notice. Um, each, at the beginning of each month following that, another notice will go out, another notice will go out, another notice will go out, each one um, trying to warn that individual that the, that the price of this ticket the fees attached to the ticket, it's all going up and could ultimately wind up with the registry of motor vehicle. And then that causes all sorts of problems when they go in to try and renew their license or registration and find out that they can't because of outstanding obligations, one of which could be parking tickets. And now I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have on that um, and, and open it up to a general discussion. Thank you. Any members, questions? Councillor Nash, I can't see you, but just wanna... Can't see me? Nope, there I can. There you are. Well, I, you know, I want to thank Nancy for Nancy spent like an hour on the phone talking to me a few weeks ago. It was a very pleasant conversation. We covered a lot of this and that um, that one of the themes was that um, is that is that where the fines really build up is that there is a disconnect, as Nancy pointed out, between the the address for the vehicle owner and wherever the vehicle owner is. So for example, if somebody's address is on, you know, on Smith Street and then they move and they don't tell the registry that they've moved, the the, the notices still go to the Smith Street address well, and, and they can pile up that way. Nancy, go we, ahead. We have um, a system in place um, through our, our vendor, our processing center, they do constant checks with the registry to 
see if there have been any updates. So by law, we send notices um, to the last known address on file with the Registry of Motor Vehicles, like you were saying. However, we try through our processing center to constantly update addresses to try to reach out to the registry and see if that person has in fact updated it. And then the next notice, once it's updated, can then go to the new address. So we, we try to help the person to help themselves in a way um, by constantly trying to update addresses. But if that person never changes their address with the Registry of Motor Vehicles, we have no option but to continue to send to the last known address on file with the registry, even though we're trying to, to reach out and find any new address. If I, I want to add here, based on our the conversation that we had, um, that the real obstacle isn't the $15 parking ticket or the $25 violation or whatever. It's, you know, what we're concerned about is how things will start to snowball into something bigger. And that mm -hmm. the bigger things are having either your, your car um, impounded or that you can't register your vehicle. Or, or your registration expires or that, um, so your vehicle's not, you can't register it because you haven't paid these fines. So um, can, can you speak to how, um, how somebody can avoid all of that? By at least paying their tickets, well, paying the park, paying their tickets before it gets to this situation, appealing the ticket to get it to be put on hold so that we can then discuss it through the appeal process if they feel that they um, got the ticket in error. Um, that's what our appeal process is there for. Um, they can, even outside of the appeal process, if somebody has a question, contact us. At least reach out to us so that we can talk to you, give you information, offer the appeal system, talk to you about whatever the situation may be um, so that we can try and work together. I, parking is bound by mass general law and city ordinance, but things happen in people's lives. And if they want to come in and talk to me, um, I'm not saying that I can make a ticket go away because that's not going to happen. But just avoiding it and not contacting, not reaching out, not doing anything about the ticket, that's when it starts to snowball because it continually goes up. And if people do in fact have the correct address of the registry and they ignore the notices that are sent out. It used to be that there was just one notice sent. And I didn't like that because one notice can be missed, get in with a bunch of other bills, whatever the case may be. That's why I have it so that some people will get up to four or five notices by the time they get themselves to the registry and get it marked so that they can't renew their registration or their license. Also, there's the situation where if a person in accordance with Mass General Law has five or more unpaid parking tickets, all of which have received at least one notice, they're eligible to have the vehicle immobilized. Now, we could tow it immediately, but I feel that by immobilizing the vehicle, Hopefully, the person will come back to the vehicle, see the vehicle is immobilized, um, be able to contact the parking office to perhaps set up a payment plan or pay it outright, pay what they owe outright to avoid having the vehicle towed. 
because then that turns into a very, very expensive situation with tow fees and storage fees. So my and feeling Nancy, is there is a possibility that the person who is accruing these tickets, um, if they're not the same person as the, the registered owner of the car, um, may not be aware that there is a there is a snowball um, effect and that the fines are piling up, increasing, right? I mean, after, I mean, I, I does that, has that happened in your, Where a person, at, how often does that happen? Say that, the, the example that you gave of a grandparent whose car is being used by someone, mm -hmm. a young person. Um, who's collecting all the tickets? And they come back to not see the, who may not see anything beyond the first ticket on the window. Yeah, no, um, I don't. I can't hear. Can you hear me now? Oh no, my audio is off again. Hello. We, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. For us saying that we hear her. Yeah, I'm going to take off these phones. You're not working right now. So um, you did, I wasn't able to hear what Nancy said. Okay, um, in answer to, to your question about whether the registered owner comes back to the car and finds out that the granddaughter has accumulated a bunch of tickets and now the, the car has been immobilized. Um, I don't recall that happening. Um, because if they've been using the car for an extended period of time, like the son or daughter who has somebody, the parent's car, and they're away at school, and they're accumulating all of these parking tickets, um, it's that person who comes back to their car. It's, it's that person who's been operating that vehicle that would be the one coming back to the car and finding them mobilized. Because more times than not, the parent lives in uh, Montana and the child is, is going to school in this area. So it's not the, the registered owner coming back to the car. It's, I haven't seen that because somebody is accumulating tickets. Actually. There's, please go ahead. Oh, I guess you can't hear. Are you all set, Megan? Um, I'll ask after, after Councilor Barge. Councilor Barge. Yes, thank you, Jen. Um, Nancy, due to the COVID-19, have mm -hmm. you had any residents from our city come to you to tell you because they lost their jobs, they didn't have the money to go ahead and pay the bill. But I think I did hear you say that you do set payments for people who can't afford to pay a bill. But has this happened in your office due, what, to, the what COVID, did? due to the COVID-19? Because yes, what I, did, I, um at the at the when when this happened when the covid situation happened um i had all of our tickets put on hold so that they did not accumulate a late fee so i had everything put on hold and we also went into free parking um and that kept the tickets at at their their original amount so they wouldn't accumulate over this time period. Um, I have had a couple of people um, say that they couldn't afford to pay the ticket because they had lost their, their job. Um, and what I did was put them on hold for an extended period of time um, so that that person could pay off even a little bit at a time mm -hmm. or or take or have some time because they were hoping to get back to work. Um, so because of this extraordinary situation, um, I put the tickets on hold so they wouldn't go up. 
thank you very much, Nancy, for your being so caring and concerned, like all of us counselors, the mayor, all the department heads, even with the taxes and so forth in the city, putting the mayor, putting it on hold until mm -hmm. July 1st, helping everybody out. Even in my ward, I had a lot of people who lost their jobs and they have children and so forth. So I'm happy to hear that you have done that. Thank you. Thank you. Member Napolitano. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering um, in terms of the numbers of people who um, are- Do we still have a session going? Are so um, uh, far along that they have their cards immobilized, for instance. Um, uh, do you have a sense of how many people that happens to uh, a year? And um, I presume that you don't have a, a sense of what their economic uh, situation is, but um, I, I would just have to ask if you have a sense of that. I, I, lost, I lost the whole meeting. I was kicked out and then I just came back in. So could you repeat whatever it was that sure. your question? Yeah. And I can probably take less time to do it this time. Um, uh, do you have a sense of how many cars are get to the stage where they're actually immobilized? Um, that people who get that far um, in the process um, from not paying fines, and do you have a sense of the economic situation of the people who um, who do get uh, stuck with an, a lot of fines? Um, I would say that there is an average of maybe eight cars a month, five, five to eight cars a month that are immobilized. We could, we could go for an extended period of time um, and have no one. And then there could be, you know, three or four in a week, but that's it for the rest of the month. Um, I think five to eight a month um, before COVID um, would be a pretty good estimate. I have no idea what people's financial situation is. Some people, they come back to the car, they call our office, they find out how much they owe, they put it, they pay it outright in cash or they put it on their credit card and it's over and done with. Some people um, have opted to use our payment plan. I, I can get involved in a payment agreement with them. And I, that is not unusual. Um, that does happen. I, I usually will um, require that there is at least a, uh, an upfront amount, um, somewhere around a third, but that could fluctuate too. Um, and then uh, we discussed what would be an appropriate amount for them and their budget depending upon their circumstances. Um, and then it, it's usually a monthly, but some people have asked just, can I pay it, you know, split it up for three months and then we'll be over and done with. Some people have taken six months. Um, but like I said, I have no idea what the, what the financial situation is for the person unless they, unless they share it with me. I think it's unfortunate reality that most um, these fees and fines that are attached to ordinances are, they're all regressive. Um, they're not affected by income or ability to pay. Um, but the other side of this, I'm curious to know, is the, um, the enforcement of um, the ordinances mm -hmm. and, you know, whether or the lack of, or the, um, whether it's, or whether they're, you know, selectively or inconsistently or excessively enforced, um, that would be interesting to us, our, our committee, because we're concerned about how this would dis disproportionately affect um, the already marginalized people and the residents of this town. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to pull any type of statistics or where tickets are issued um, over the course of a year. I, I have to caution that during the, the COVID um, month that we've 
that we are going through, um, the numbers are, are very different than what they would have been last year and during a normal year. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it might be just, just understand that that's why you're going to see very different numbers and the amount of tickets that are issued and that sort of thing, because unfortunately people are not in the city. Um, they're not what? people aren't in the city shopping going to restaurants you know smith isn't open so the amount of vehicles in the city have been reduced so drastically that our numbers are going to be very different than what they would during a normal year but i'm happy to pull any kind of statistics. Sure. thank you council labard Yes, I'm pretty sure it was mentioned at our city council meeting through our mayor at that time of the parking and so forth, the amount of money that we had lost due uh, because of the parking and so forth. Yeah. The COVID-19. Exactly what you said, Nancy. Right. There's a significant difference. Mm-hmm. Any other questions from the members? Um, See me. <laughs> Councilor Nash. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Nancy, what I'm trying to figure out is I mean, so there's cases where we have people who are repeat offenders. They just don't, they just park, they accumulate tickets, they, you know, they get the boot and then they just go over and pay and they, you know, and they don't like it, but they have the means to do take care of that. Um, what we're more concerned with here is the people who who can't be that uh, flagrantly just kind of just blowing everything off. That there are there cases where somebody could get just one or two tickets and then they end up having their car immobilized. No, no, it's five or more by law, uh, by Mass General Law. It's five or more unpaid violations, all of which have received at least one notice, and. Um, my policy is that that one notice, it's not the next day after the notice is sent out. Uh, my feeling is a person should have 30 days to respond to that notice. Um, so, so I, I'm not so trying to jump on. somebody reaches that point, they're, get, they're gonna have been sent four to five notices telling them that they need to pay up and that, and towards the end, they're getting notices saying that your car will be immobilized. This is imminent. And that, um, uh, and during all of that, so let's say at all of, that it's five parking tickets. What would the total cost? It, so a ticket is, it's a $15 ticket. It becomes a $25 ticket. And then what's the next step up? Um, prior to um, going to the registry, um, it, it's eligible to go to the registry right. um, 60 days after the due date. So at which point prior to notification of the registry, an additional $10 late fee is placed on it. And then the registry is notified, at which point a registry surcharge of $20 is added to it. So 15, 25, uh, out of $45 for, so those theoretical five tickets are now $45 each. Did Nancy freeze? She's not moving. <laughs> Am, am I in the meeting or am I, did I just kick you? Yeah, you, you kind You're of here. appeared. You kind of. Okay. So my question was, so those five tickets are now $45 each and somebody can come in and pay those off before they get immobilized, right? Yeah. And they can work out a, a payment plan or something like that. And that, um, so I'm just trying to think of the threshold of where you know, that all of these things have happened before somebody's car is immobilized. And um, so I think in the case, I, you know, in my mind, I keep thinking of somebody who's 
repeatedly parking downtown and just not okay. putting money uh, in the theater. And, and I think that um, what we're more concerned about around this is somebody who's, I don't know, I, I'm thinking like at, you know, uh, somebody who needs their car to get to work that for some reason they're getting tickets on like Phillips place or something like that. Everybody just disappeared. Where did we go? Okay. I'm back now. Okay. <laughs> Are you, can, can you speak to cases of like what we're concerned about here? which has to do with people who are dependent on their vehicle. They're not the folks parking downtown. They're just, you know, somebody who's parking on Phillips Place or Graves Avenue or something like that. And they're getting tickets for some reason. And that um, maybe it's they park too near to somebody's driveway. And um, how often are people in those situations having their vehicles immobilized? I think she froze again. I think she froze. I apologize, but I seem to keep getting kicked out of the meeting. Um, am I back? Yes. We're back. Okay. I don't want to ask my question again. It was so long. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so yes, the person is getting notices prior to their vehicle being immobilized. Um, so yes. All right, so I guess my last question is this, is that the real um, point where, I, how much control do we have over these things? I mean, somebody, if somebody gets a, a parking ticket, we're, we're, we're impelled to give them a parking ticket. Here's your fine. And that, um, but at, the, at what point are, are, and we're required by Mass General Law to report to the registry, correct, if it hasn't been paid? Or could we withhold that? Um, well, the law says that, you know, if, if you look under 20A and a half, it, it says that um, the registry will be notified of, of non-payment. But that's a case of where the city accepted mass general law to be part of that process. Well, we accepted 20 A and one half, and that is a part of that section that we accepted. Okay. So then if we didn't, if, if we, I don't know if we, we can read, we can pull out of once we've accepted mass general law and Counselor Seawald would know that, but that would be one of those, um, or Attorney Seawald, that would be one of those wa ways where we could stop the snowballing and we just keep it all in-house. Well, you know, if you, if you are considering pulling out of that section, um, you have to understand that that section also covers the appointment of your parking, um, department, the administration of that parking department, the authority to issue tickets for violations, what the tickets have to say on them, what type of information has to be on it by law, you know, um, that it has to be placed on the vehicle. So you're talking about a lot of, inf a lot of authority and information that's contained within that section if you were to pull out of the section, um, you basically would be pulling out of your parking. Um, so I guess then my question for attorney Seawald would be around this particular 20 A and a half is whether we can take out that one piece where we don't report to the registry, we keep it in house so that when I mean in house, it's in terms of the city, it's our fines. It's not reported to the registry. People aren't going to have their their, their cars uh, lose their registration because of it. I'm just trying to look at different ways that we could play this out. Because right now it's a conveyor belt of us increasingly involving the, the Commonwealth that has this increase going on. 
So if I if I may respond. Oh yeah, uh, please. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, a, a a local acceptance statute cannot be unaccepted unless the statute itself has a specific procedure for unaccepting it. We would need a special act of the legislature to unaccept the statute. Unless I haven't read 28 and a half recently, I have read it in the past, so I don't know if that's in there. But if it's not, then you would have to, you know, have a special act of the legislature. And to answer your other question, if we accept the statute, we can't accept everything except the reporting to the state. It's 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 all or none. Thank you. Okay. It, isn't it less a little bit less complicated than that? Isn't it essentially just um, saying that? the part where uh, the law provides reporting this to the state um, the department of motor vehicles that that that, that is that a shall report it to the, the state or is it a may report it to the state well that's a good question um i can pull it up I don't know about the part uh, regarding reporting this to the state, but there, it does say that if somebody has failed to appear in accordance with five or more said notices, not sending any notification to the registrar, the parking clerk may notify the chief of police or director of traffic or park, parking um, that the vehicle That's shall be removed or stored. If I may, Mr. Chair. You may. Um, if any person fails to appear in accordance with said notice, the parking clerk shall notify the registrar of motor vehicle Thank vehicles you. who shall place the matter on record and blah, 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 blah. That's a shall. Thank you. And if you go down another, the other paragraph, um, the issue of whether to immobilize or store the, the car is a may. So that's actually that's so that's just to make that distinction. True. Hmm. So it sounds like we have some latitude around immobilizing a car, but we don't have latitude around reporting it to the registry, which it has its own um, uh, what's the word? Uh, bad things to happen. <laughs> um, um, Councilor Nash, before you go too much further, I just would like to uh, caution that you are straying deep into the executive function here and uh, the manner of carrying out these laws is entrusted to the mayor. So I just want to caution that, you know, this. I'm just thinking this all aloud so that so that we're, we're giving this a fair airing right now of, you know, because people are concerned about it. And um, so, yes, I, I hear you. Thank you. So I'm just curious about that, um, about what you just said. So how is it, so this doesn't affect, this is not part of the ordinances? The, the uh, much of what we're talking about is controlled by the statute. We set by ordinance, we set the, the fine. Mm -hmm. Essentially everything else is carried out by the mayor. So the part about may um, put a boot on a vehicle that falls under the, the decision make uh, uh, under the executive. Correct, Alan? That would be my, that would be my position that that would fall to the executive to determine how best to carry out the 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 ordinance which set the set the fine and the statutes that were accept the statute that was accepted that creates the structure around which uh, parking is enforced. I mean, just like you couldn't tell the mayor not to hire PEOs, you couldn't tell the mayor the PEOs should be on one side of the street but not the other. 
That's well, the mayor's function. But we could pass an ordinance or the city council could pass an ordinance that says that people's cars aren't going to be immobilized um, if, they're a, if they don't pay fines. I disagree. Yeah, I do too. But there currently is an ordinance that said that they can do that, but you can't have an ordinance that says that they can't? I believe that we were reading from the statute. Right, but wouldn't, isn't there an ordinance? I actually don't have the parking ordinance in front of me, but I mean, isn't there an ordinance in the, in the Northampton, isn't there a Northampton ordinance that outlines how this is going, to, how parking and parking enforcement is done? In what sense? It says that we... That's done through the administrative orders. The mayor passes administrative orders and we'll, we'll talk about administrative orders when we get to the, I think the next section, when we go through the ordinances that I've reviewed. Administrative ordinances are, uh, administrative uh, orders, the administrative code is not, they're not ordinances. No, they okay. emanate from the That's, mayor. Got it. Not from okay. the I, thought it I, I thought this was in, in the ordinances, sorry. So I'd like to uh, ha ask Nancy to speak to another aspect of what falls under her jurisdiction, which has to do with abandoned vehicles, because that's another situation where you will, will you um, immobilize an abandoned vehicle or you just have it towed? I think she's connected. I'm not hearing him. Oh, okay. So, so Nancy, <laughs> like, can you speak to abandoned vehicles? Because I think that's the one that really gets uh, to the heart of uh, of people who are, uh, are are marginalized and 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 people who are struggling. Because when we talked about this, people have abandoned vehicles when. The vehicle just stops working. They have no means to fix it. It's parked on the street and it just never starts. That that those are the types of situations where the car is then put into storage and um, you said it's like fifty dollars a day type fees. And that those are the things that you know. So that suddenly somebody's paying huge fines um, or or fees for. A vehicle that no longer runs and that they in some cases they may not be fully aware of what's going on around the the stacking of those fees did you hear me i heard you um so we do not issue we meaning parking does not issue um, a ticket or an abandoned vehicle notice that's handled through the police department um, a, vehicles that wind up in my office um, are there because the police department has issued an abandoned vehicle notice to a vehicle um, that has been left in a tow yard um, and the tow company has not received any reply um, to the uh, registered notices that they send to the last known address of the last known owner. And once they go through the tow company that has the vehicle in their lot, um, goes through the process of trying to notify the person, um, they contact the police department who then goes and reviews the situation, issues an abandoned vehicle notice if, if appropriate, and then provides the file on that abandoned vehicle to me, at which point um, I then notify that person that an abandoned vehicle hearing has been set for them to come in um, and discuss the situation. Um, at that point, the fine has already been placed on it. Um, 
And it is simply an abandoned vehicle hearing that's happening at my office. And what kind of fines are we talking? Can, what can the range be here? It's $150. Uh, but in terms of the storage fees and things like that, um, that I I'm not involved in that. That you know that that um, the the police department has a, a contract. I know that they have um, various co companies that have to abide by the conditions of that contract. Now these vehicles that are abandoned. The reason why Northampton becomes involved in the situation is because that, ve that vehicle is now abandoned in the city of Northampton. That doesn't mean it necessarily came from the city of Northampton. It could have been towed there because a vehicle was stopped by Massachusetts State Police up on 91 and one of the Northampton tow companies responded and towed that vehicle. And now it's here in Northampton in a tow yard where they haven't been able to get in contact with that person who's the last known owner, last known registered owner. So, or it could have been left abandoned at, um, you know, a, a repair shop and it was a private tow, or it was left abandoned in a parking lot and that was a private tow. But it's, it's in a Northampton tow yard. And that's why I'm involved in it. I think we lost Nancy again. Okay, I'm back. I'm back. Okay. I'm here. I am. How far did I get? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so real quick. The abandoned vehicle, the file comes to me because the vehicle has been left abandoned in a Northampton tow yard. That doesn't mean that it necessarily came from the city of Northampton, that that vehicle came from Northampton or came to us as a result of a Northampton Police Department tow. It could have been a tow from a repair shop that called in a private tow, a Northampton tow company towed it to their yard and now it's been left abandoned in Northampton. And now it, it winds up on my desk through the police department that it's an abandoned vehicle. It could have been a tow from 91 by Mass State Police and it's been towed by a Northampton tow yard. Am I still here? Still here. Could it be a stolen vehicle also, Nancy? I think we lost her again. Oh, she's still there. Uh, I think. Yeah. No. Frozen. Nancy. Frozen. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. I think we lost her, Laura. So two. Okay. So my thoughts on this is that I think we need more study and discussion around how precisely we can actually do some intervention here, because it so much of it is, we, you know, that um, that it's it's the way we're um, merged with mass general law that impels us to do a lot of things and that kind of gets things um, going and that, um, you know, I'd be willing to look into this more to see if there's ways that, you know, like um, uh, uh, Attorney Seawald was mentioning, you know, that some of this rests with the executive that to start figuring out, well, where are those different places that we might have some choice that it's, maybe it's not an ordinance or council, but it could be reside with the mayor, but at least figure out where those pieces are and, um, and so I'd be willing to look into that some more and report back to folks. Thank you, Councillor Nash. Nancy back yet or no? Jeff? Um, I just am, am curious um, or slightly confused. I actually um, don't 
have any desire to delve into the details of the parking, but um, the delineation of what we can and, and can't uh, address, I'm curious about, just because I know that, I mean, I just looked up that the um, the code of ordinances, that the, all of the stuff that we're talking about, much of the stuff that we're talking about is um, in under the part two of the code of ordinances, which is under general legislation. Um, and I'm just curious, I mean, be, because it goes into such detail as specifying that, you know, not just uh, what can be done, but like where you can put up, where, where things like the parking meters and all sorts of things uh, can be put up and, and done. And in, in, in fact, directing penalties to, to um, conform with certain um, state statutes. Uh, is, isn't this part of the ordinances? Isn't the stuff that's under the general legislation under the code of ordinances stuff that um, is under our purview? May I respond to that? Yeah, I was asking you, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So uh, let me just say that um, uh, long ago, when I first started and right after the charter was passed, the mayor told me that he was not going to make an issue of where parking meters go and whether the city council could delineate that. Generally, the city council has the control of the use of the ways, streets, the sidewalks. So there's a lot, there are a lot of ordinances about how the streets um, and ways should be used or may be used. Once they pass the ordinance on how they can be used, it's up to the, the mayor to determine how best to enforce that, whether to have PEOs or not to have PEOs, whether the PEOs are gonna have vehicles or not, whether um, how often they're gonna circulate, uh, whether you know all of that is, is executive function. But the policies for how the public way is used are still within the jurisdiction of the city council. And I think my dog's about to bark. So I'm gonna go on mute for just. Sure, but just, I mean, in the, in the, the, the list of um, the ordinances here, it, it, it's, it, it does include things like penalties. So, I mean, I guess right. my question is, like, since there's ordinances that impose the penalties and detail the penalties and how the penalties are gonna happen, um, in addition to all other aspects of parking, how how is it? I, I understand that once there is a policy, it is up to the discretion of the executive to in, to to implement that policy. But but given that the ordinances describe the policy, uh, including the penalties, doesn't that come under what we're talking about? There's another statute that deals with fines and penalties and how that's set, and it's. Um, and either it can be set by ordinance as this is, or it's set by department. But for parking fines, uh, they are set by ordinance and that's how it's done. Uh, but the specifics of how that is enforced are the mayors. Would it be still be within the purview? And, and Jeff, I will also point out that some of those uh, ordinances you're looking at also predate the charter. And um, for instance, uh, I recall there's one in there about the police chief towing. Um, I think the, that the police chief could tow without the ordinance, but it's in there, predates the, uh, the charter. So I'm curious to know, like at this point, we're still kind of trying to figure out what is within the purview of this, this committee and, you know, whether something like that, it could be an, you know, would be an executive decision at some point, but um, would it still be appropriate for us to include that in as one of our recommendations in our report? We're reviewing ordinances here. And, and uh, so, you know, the question is, is this an ordinance that you're recommending? Or, or a change to an existing like our, ordinance, right? Yeah. Correct. An amendment to a, or, I mean, I, I thought our mandate was much broader than that, um, but. But it relates to ordinances, specifically to ordinances, not to the administrative code or to any other body of law, it's the ordinances that we're focused on. You know, and, and I will say that, that, and I think the counselors who are on this committee can tell you 
that the jurisdiction of the council outside of money is rather limited. The, the big authority of the council is around money. And so, um, you know, and, and as we saw with the, the whole police budget, there is an avenue to be pursued if you want to change things through the budgetary process, but that's not ordinance. No, but um, so when I'm looking at the code of ordinances online for mm -hmm. the city of Northampton, mm -hmm. I, I was under the impression, which I guess is wrong, but I'm just curious as to why it's wrong that the, everything that comes under code of ordinances are the ordinances that we're discussing. Well, the, the code that's online is comprised of many different things or several different things. It's, it's comprised of the charter, the administrative code and the code of ordinances. Right. So the court and so code you, of ordinances is what we're talking about, right? Correct. Not the administrative code and not the charter. We already did the charter last year. I guess what Jeff is asking is of the 700 or so pages of the code of ordinance, um, how much do we have jurisdiction over there? <laughs> it's true, Jim. Well, I, I just want to make sure that your the, the reference to code of ordinances is is your reference is the same as mine. There are ordinances, there's the administrative code, and there's the charter. Your and jurisdiction all here. Into one in so when I pull up that thing online, the 700 pages, it's all folded together, is what you're saying. So when I, when I go online, which is what I'm doing now, and I click on code, yeah. I have ch the charter and related acts, the administrative code, and then the code of ordinances, part one and part two, those are all ordinances. But that's all that this committee is focused on are the ordinances, not the charter and related acts, and not the administrative code. No, sure, sure, absolutely. But like the, the the part about the ordinances regarding parking and parking enforcement is it it, it falls under that. It's under the yep. second part of the yep. code of ordinances. It's very extensive. I mean, and so yep. it goes towards penalties and not just not just the finances, not just the you know the the amounts of money, but it also how things are right. going to be um, um uh, how penalties are going to be imposed, who they're you know under what circumstances and so forth. So it seems pretty granular. I'm going there myself. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we delve into the however 300, you know, pages of the of the parking thing. I'm just saying that it's there. Right. And some of it's been there for a very long time and is frankly inconsistent with the charter for pr police authorized to direct traffic. We don't need a, an ordinance to authorize the police uh, to direct traffic. Now, authority of the police ch chief to temporary closed streets, that's something that is an appropriate ordinance because again, the, the city council has control over the ways, but how the, the police chief closes the way, whether, they, whether the police chief, whether she puts up barricades or she puts up barrels or she puts up signs or how she closes the street, completely up to the, the executive department just like how we enforce parking up to the executive. We don't have to use a boot, but if the executive determines that that's the, the best way, uh, considering all factors to enforce our parking regulations, it's up to the mayor. Sure, but if the city council were to pass an ordinance that say that there, the boots weren't going to be used, and again, I'm not saying that that's, that's I'm in no way suggesting that, but I'm saying that if there was an ordinance that said we're not going to use boots in the city of Northampton, that can be written no, the, to the code, right? So the, the charter says that the, the legislature shall never exercise an executive function and the executive shall never exercise a legislative function. To me, the determination of how to enforce the parking fines is up to the mayor. But the fact that fines even exist and what they are set at is outlined in in the ordinances because the statute requires an ordinance to set the fines that's statutory okay so the city council's jurisdiction in most instances instances is statutory okay there are some 
you know, charter provisions. So for instance, we have to do zoning by ordinance. So the city council has to pass zoning ordinances for us to have zoning. But how we enforce the zoning is gonna be up to the, the, the mayor, not up to the city council. Sure. And so likewise, the statute requires that parking fines be set by ordinance. So we have an ordinance for parking fines. Mm -hmm. That's why we have an ordinance for parking fines. The city council will designate no parking areas. So how to enforce no parking areas? Up to the mayor. Because the, the city council controls the ways and designates generally the use of the ways. We had this situation that, you know, this came to a head one of the first times when I was uh, uh, early in my tenure as city solicitor, when the city council wanted to designate the locations of handicapped parking at the senior center. And my position was the city council designates how many uh, handicapped spots there needs to be under the ordinance. And then the mayor figures out where they're gonna go. So my thought is, I, I think I, I would like to move on from the parking discussion and, and, and move on to some of the other things on our agenda. Um, if uh, uh, I, I, I'm willing to explore more with the with Attorney Seawald, the idea of whether or not we can ban the use of boots the same way we ban the use of camera down uh, surveillance cameras downtown. Um, but um, anyway, but I, I think it'd be good for us to table this for now. And um, and and as Attorney Seawald is saying that in let you know if we can come up with specific ordinances to uh, propose here. Because I, this discussion was just like to give us an overview, to like understand what what the dynamics are at, at play here and, and where we have some uh, latitude. And um, so my suggestion would be, let's move on to something else on the agenda. And I, I'm more than happy to explore this all further and report back to people. So you're suggesting to you're, in you order want to, to you want to table this for another for another uh, meeting, Councilor Nash. Um, I think it's up to your discretion. You know that that, that you can. I, I'm suggesting it, and um, I I don't think we need a vote on it. You, as the chair, can decide to move on. Right. Well, we're going to move on because we have a two-hour limit, which I like to stick to. But I also um, take into consideration um, your thoughtful approach to this Councilor Nash along with uh, uh, member Napolitano, Megan Pake, um, Marianne Labarge and hearing from attorney Seawald. So this, this discussion, and I don't want uh, member Napolitano to think that I'm cutting him off here because this, this, nope. the, this, You're not. <laughs> this, this is not going to be uh, something that's gonna get done tonight. So I have no problem with um, continuing this discussion and uh, for uh, down the road and that's how we will leave it. So this is um, going to be suspended uh, for right now. We will carry this uh, at another meeting. And thank you, Nancy. And, and thank Nancy, you, are you still Lee. here? I'm here and I apologize. I wasn't able to give you the information that you wanted on the abandoned vehicle. Um, yeah. It's all good. But but I'm happy to it, you know, at, at another time when I have a better connection. Great. But before you freeze up again, just want to make sure we say thank you. And I greatly appreciate you taking the time to be here this evening with us. Uh, my pleasure. And if at any time you need any other information, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I'm happy to help out in any way. Thank Good. you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. So next, we're going to move on to suggested ordinance changes not yet referred to the city solicitor. Um, up next, we have the demands of unhoused organizers presented by Taylor Porco and 
I know everyone here has read the um, email and um, we've heard from Taylor earlier. Um, this would fall, if I'm not mistaken, this would fall under uh, uh, bucket list item number two, which are issues brought to the attention by department heads and members of the public. Any discussion? Councilor Nash. Yeah, so um, it, it, so I, you know, I, 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 I very much appreciate the, the, the letter that Tay has sent to us. Um, I, I've done, a, you know, I, I did a, some research on camping within city ordinance and tents. And I, you know, and attorney Seawald can help me out here. Maybe, maybe it needs to be looked into, but I, I couldn't find anything that was banning uh, camping on, on public property within, within the city. There, um, I think that there, that if, it, that some, if somebody wants to set up a tent on private property and has the permission of the property owner, that's fine, they can do that. And that, um, but in terms of uh, public area for, I, I didn't see anything, I'm not, I'm not, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not promoting that people start doing that, um, that um, I, I'm not sure that, uh, I, I wouldn't support people camping out in, in Pulaski Park. Um, I would support the idea of us exploring a way for people to, uh, to camp safely somewhere in the city to come up with something that, you know, because right now people are, they're, they're camping in the woods by the highway, they're camping along the bike path, they're camping in all sorts of areas that um, they, they aren't near um, sanitary facilities, they're, they don't have access to water, they don't have easy access to where they can dispose of trash and things like that. And I, I'd be willing to, to have that discussion to provide that, you know, figure out a way to provide that sort of accommodation. Um, but in terms of the, 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 the camping piece, I, I didn't see a ban for that in city ordinance. Um, so um, let me see, what else? I, you know, in terms of, and, and perhaps, you know, I, um, I, I, I would like to hear a, from, from Tay about vacant properties, specifically um, which properties they are referring to. I mean, because we do have a lot of of commercial properties that are vacant in the downtown area. There, and we're going to have more in the coming months. Um, but I'm not aware of a lot of vacant um, residential properties. Um, and that, um, so that, I, you know what? Maybe um, if um, I, I'd like, would it be okay to recognize Tay to get some clarification on that? So I would, so you'd like to, I would have no problem with um, um, recognizing Tay to be heard on this um, matter. Do any of the other members have any objection to Tay being heard? Okay, Tay, you're up. Awesome, yeah, no, thank you for, and that's what I think we were trying to address at the beginning of public comment is that Northampton doesn't have one solid ordinance um, that is outlining how people are getting criminalized for living outside, sleeping outside and being in public spaces. Um, and trying to give me one second. And this is actually in the follow-up email I was gonna send everybody is like some of the different, and so maybe this is a different understanding after just hearing some of that conversation go down about ordinances versus charter versus like zoning and that kind of stuff. Some of this was found in um, the zoning section in the e-code portion of the website. Um, and I have, I'm gonna just send that to the group later, but I have it um, copied down some of the different sections and chapters. And I think some of it has to do also with parks and recreation areas. So it's not just about um, 
it, it's it's kind of found in a bunch of different areas. It has to do with um, different ordinances and zoning on sidewalks. So Northampton kind of has figured it out through private spaces as well as public spaces. So private spaces, um, Northampton can get anybody on with just trespassing. And then <clears throat> with public spaces, um, people, there's di between different times of the year and time of day, people aren't allowed to exist in those spaces. Um, legally, there's different stuff on it. And I'm sorry, I can't find it, but there, there is different codes that have to do with um, where people are allowed to be and then all of those do not allow for people to sleep in public spaces so people can be in public spaces without getting a trespass order but that's often not what is happening either people are getting trespass um, summons based on basically any time that um, the city doesn't want unhoused people in public or feels like they're being a nuisance because it's not always consistent, but it's consistent with certain people. Um, so that's one thing about the camping. So I think I should have, that should have been worded differently, not camping ordinance, but it has to do with temporary structures um, and just different wording in all of these different sections of the website that have to do um, with making it, with basically giving Northampton the power to push people out of encampments that are in the woods, um, that are under bridges um, as they'd like. And we have a history of that. And I have some articles on when there have been encampment sweeps in Northampton as well. And then I'm trying to remember, what was the second thing? Oh, the vacant properties. So that's actually, yeah, I was, Northampton doesn't have, or only has like three or four public vacant properties right now, but there, um, there have been, well, there are plenty um, private properties that have been vacant for years and years. And I know everybody is aware of some of the specific landlords and private property owners who are doing that. And I know that there's been frustration with not like, what do you do with that? Because they're private property. And so this kind of goes hand in hand is that also Northampton, and as I highlighted in the email, <clears throat> is gifted and receives public property um, it, like pretty, pretty frequently in the last five and 10 years um, and almost immediately sells that to private developers. So when people are saying, Northampton, can you make affordable housing? Um, and let's talk about properties available or spaces available, land available to do this. And Northampton saying, well, we don't have anything. We'd have to completely build new things. We know this isn't true. And we know that Northampton does just immediately sell these to private developers or, or um, just people who are give it, offering the biggest bid. So that's like, that's what I was saying, I think is the most imperative thing that happens is a, is a ban and, and an ordinance ban on Northampton um, for, for property and land that is gifted to the city or is received um, by previously private property owners is that that is used for affordable housing first and foremost until we get people housing and that there is enough housing and people can pay for housing um, in Northampton and then there's a lot of ways for the private property um, for what, what do we do when people have kept private property um, vacant for five years, 10 years. Um, then the, the follow up there would be there's registration, there's vacant property registrations, there's land baking, there's eminent domain. So there's a lot of different ways in which Northampton can incentivize against keeping these private, these properties um, vacant. But my concern there is that if that is to happen, um, we need to make sure that vacant, that any vacant property that become, it, 
is then given to the public domain that that is used for affordable housing first and foremost, because if not, we're in the same cycle of nobody can afford rent, nobody, yeah, nobody can live here unless you're wealthy. So, um, and we have, well, it's just gonna be the exact same thing. We're gonna have people on the street right now, we're in a pandemic, blah, blah, blah. We, we know all of this, but um, so yeah, those are, that's covering the vacancy stuff on the public okay. domain and the private. So thank you, Tay. Would you mind sending this, this information, a follow-up and send it to um, our uh, Laura Crutzler so she can forward it to all of us? Would you mind doing that, Tay? Yes. Um, can you, or where can I get the, that email? Or you can send it to um, um, city council at northamptonma.gov. We'll get it. Okay. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us too. Yeah. And Councillor Nash, I, I, I know you probably wanted to follow up with this, but I wanna keep us on track and move us forward. No, I think um, that what's good is we're, we're having a discussion here and we're, we're clarifying stuff. And I, I look forward to Tay's communications and, um, and, and researching this. I, I appreciate Tay that you've been looking through the e-code and it, 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 it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff in there and, um, and I often get lost as well. So um, if you found stuff that I didn't find, that doesn't surprise me. So uh, I, I, I'd very be, be very interested in um, whatever, um, what, what you have to share, so. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Nash, and thank you, Tay. So are we comfortable with sending this to bucket two, or do you want to hold off? I, I actually have a question, if, if it's a quick question. And that's just um, other particular, because we, we, we did this with other examples, other examples of cities, because obviously we're not the only city that has issues with folks that are um, without uh, houses. Uh, so without housing, um, are there examples that we can draw from other places that have successfully or at least tried to address um, this issue that we could look at? I don't yeah. Know. Oh, are you oh. talking to me or no? I, I was talking to you or anybody who could answer this question. Okay, I, yeah, there are, and that's actually, um, a few people wrote me back about the email I sent and asking for examples. So I have a lot of them. And I think that's why some of these I'm saying, we don't wanna follow just everybody who has managed to do a variety of the things being asked because some of them have just been used in the name of gentrification. That's why like ordinances and things around property um, can very easily get manipulated. And so, yeah, but there is, there's a lot of examples on for even the ban the box, how to enforce that. And there's issues there too. That's why a lot of this is just like bare minimum first step, but um, other cities have figured out how to, DC has figured out how to enforce that in workplaces, um, fair, what is it? Fair chance hire or the housing ordinance tons of cities have done that. We have, um, I forget what town or city in Massachusetts has or is on the way to legalizing or decriminalizing all um, encampments and stopping all sweeps of encampments. So there are, the cities have done this and I think we can like look at those and then build off of those for, Northampton is a very specific space and so I think yeah following based off of that but a lot of cities have done the eminent domain the vacant property registration land baking um, and figuring out ways to incentivize against or penalize um, for all of this so yeah and I'll be happy to I'll send this an email to everybody with the examples and just a follow up about all of this. Thank you, Tay. Remember there in 2018, I think is the year, there was a, can you hear me? There was a temporary encampment um, off of Texas Road by the river. And um, the, 
I don't know what what ordinances <clears throat> there you know would be in violation of, if any, but um, the um, the city did not want to was only prompted by the owners of the private property the encampment was on to um, to respond, um, and the mayor um, Ronald Riker saying that he's very reluctant to um, to take down an encampment when the city cannot provide housing, alternative safe and sanitary housing for um, the people living there. So it's, I think it is a matter of enforcement more than anything else in this town. Um, and also possibly just more community education. Um, I, I think um, the Human Rights Commission has talked a lot about how to help foster a, you know, a culture of uh, tolerance right now, um, because we are expecting, we're expecting a lot more you know, evictions and people, unhoused people um, during this very, very difficult time. And um, there really is just, the reality is there's just not, there will not be any, <clears throat> there will not be any other places for them to go in town. So, um, you know, we can talk about possibly, um, I, th I think we need to talk about other sort of sorts of assistance, like offering, um, you know, water stations and um, I don't know, more, you know, safe, if not a warming, Shelter, uh, shelters than um, equipment and supplies and things that would actually um, make it safer and easier for people that do have to continue living outdoors. So. Okay, we're gonna have to move on. E. Okay. We're gonna I do want to say one more thing about the, the ban the box law, and I know it's getting to the end of our meeting um, that that yep. Tay has put in her letter. Um, but I think the issue is that right now a lot of those complaints are sent to MCAT, employment related complaints are sent to MCAT because we do not have a local like administrative, uh, an office that would administer these administrative complaints. So um, that is, that is, I think there, so we, we don't have that resource right now um, here in town, but anyway. Maybe. Council LaBarge. Yeah, Megan, are you talking about at City Hall, we don't have an office or are you talking about we don't have some place in the city? We don't have, we don't have a, an office in the city to deal with complaints, anything that's related to human rights, which includes like um, mm -hmm. you know, fair employment practices. So. I know we had a problem for several years where um, even people with social security and so forth, they have to go to Holyoke. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't drive and there's problems with transportation, so. I don't know, maybe you're right. Maybe we should look at having an area where it is visible for people to be able to complain. Do we want to refer this to box number two, bucket number two? Yep. Yes? Yes. Okay. Laura, roll call please on referring this. Do we have a motion and a second on the floor? Well, I didn't hear it. You, you're going to be the first one, Councilor LaBarge, if you can make a motion. I'll make that motion. Oh, I muted myself. Are you going to second, Councilor oh, Nash? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, roll call. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor Thorpe? Yes. Member Peck? Yes. And Member Napolitano? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so that's been referred. Next on the agenda, report on ordinance changes already referred. 
presentation by city solicitor Alan Seewald. Alan? Oh, I think I've covered up my, my camera. Hello again. Uh, so I did send out a memo this afternoon. And uh, so I, I, I don't want to belabor this. I don't have a lot of comments. Uh, as you can see, most of what was submitted is, is appropriate. Um, so there were five categories of uh, uh, proposed ordinances or uh, something like that uh, sent to me. The first one was called Ordinance Cleanup, which was actually the Office of uh, Planning and, and Sustainability's list. There were 14 of them. I don't have any problem with any of them. They seem like appropriate housekeeping uh, amendments. Um, I, I pointed out that in 337-10C, which, uh, which would be eliminated, we would need to uh, redesignate the following subsections. I just wanted to add that. Um, I had, a, with regard to, um, mis are there any questions about the Office of Planning and Sustainability? Okay, uh, Mr. Zimnock uh, submitted a number of, of uh, proposed uh, changes. Uh, with regard to the 12 feet by versus 15 feet, if you want to deal with that, I talked to uh, uh, DPW Director Lascalia. She said 12 feet would be the appropriate number uh, for the enforcement in, in, in uh, Chapter 40. However, she said, uh, this is a very problematic ordinance and one that needs some much more detailed looking at because as she pointed out, she was on my street during the last uh, event when all the trees came down on my street and I live on a side street off of South Street. And she said, everyone parking on your street is in, in violation of this ordinance. Everyone parking on every side street in the city is probably in violation of this ordinance. And so we've got to think more you know, on a, uh, about this ordinance. I'm not suggesting that this committee do that. Uh, it's really not something that fits well within what you've chosen to focus on. But um, if you want to make them consistent, go to 12 feet, even though uh, it's not really, it, it can't be enforced on any widespread basis because there are just too many of them. And this has also become a, a problem, um, something that does more fall within what you've uh, chosen to look at. Along Florence Road was an example uh, near, um, near Ryan Road where people park in Florence Road where there's, it's not designated no parking. There's no, there aren't parking spaces, but they park right in the middle of, right, right on Florence Road to go swimming, you know, in the river there. And, you know, what do you do? I mean, there's, there's not, you know, are we talking about a 12 foot lane on one side of the road? Are we talking about the whole road? Uh, it's really problematic, this ordinance, but to make it consistent, go to 12 feet. That's what she said. Going on to, uh, I, I did leave out one of Mr. Zimnock's requests to change, and he did suggest going from 40C to 40D, which is correct. The reference in the, uh, in the ordinance is, is incorrect. It should be 40D, so I have no problem with that. And the next two proposed uh, amendments are to the administrative code, as we discussed before. He would like the mayor to formalize the historical commission's role in the cemeteries. That's for the mayor to do, and I will pass these along to the mayor, but those, those are not ordinances. So I, I, I didn't review them as ordinances. Um, miscellaneous changes already discussed. Um, they're fine, all of them are fine, but I was a little confused by 116-1, which um, provides that if any residence or place of business has a, an intrusion alarm, they're liable under chapter 40. I think it should say a false intrusion alarm because what we're penalizing in chapter 40 are false alarms, not alarms. Um, so I made note of that. Um, Stop me if anyone has any questions. Uh, with regard to uh, Councilor Jarrett's proposed commercial buffer zone, I think it would be a nightmare to enforce, uh, but certainly within the authority of the city to do. Uh, it's not zoning, so there's no uniformity problem. Um, certainly can do it if that's what uh, is chosen 
to be done. And finally, allowing two families by right in every, uh, in every district is, is in my inbox, as I say, and uh, it's going to be before the council probably in December. That's, the, that's what we're targeting. So that was my review of this batch of proposed ordinances. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Attorney Seawall, for doing this. Any of the members have questions? I would like to discuss uh, 116 and the commercial buffer zone okay. proposal at the next meeting. Would that be something that uh, Councillor Jarrett should? Uh, yes. Yep. Be to discuss? He's indicated that he will probably attend. Okay. Anyone else questions? Jeff, I don't see you on my screen. I just want to. Nope. I'm okay. sorry. I was shaking my head now. Nope. <laughs> Council of Barge. Yes. Alan, um, on that commercial buffer zone proposal, I didn't hear what you said. Did you agree to it or not? I said that it was certainly within the authority of the city to enact. I see some, some just logistical issues with it. Um, knowing exactly where the, the line is and for, you know, people to know they're on one side of the line and not the other into, a, you know, most of this is about garbage pickup. Right. And when I talked to Wayne, I also talked to Wayne about this today. And, you know, he said, this is mostly about garbage pickup early in the morning with dumpsters getting dumped into trucks. And um, so, but, um, you know, we will be, enforcing rules against um, you know one neighbor and not the next neighbor because the next neighbor is you know the next business is going to be over the line you can have uh, trash picked up earlier um, uh, I think that you know the council has seen the difficulty of code enforcement and uh, gets very difficult to enforce code as we've seen around the rivers this summer and other places in town very difficult. So that's my only concern, but certainly can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? So Laura, number four will be at the next meeting. Hey. Oh, Councilor Jarrett, thank you. Thank you again, Attorney Seawald. Moving on from there. Next is proposals for expanded notification of zoning map changes and special permits. Yeah, so that's mine and I'm willing to table that till next time. Thank you, because I can. <laughs> and, and also I sent out a document, people only got, you may have gotten it like a couple of hours ago, even though it's very clear, <laughs> I, I still think people need a little more time to take it all in. Yes. Is that something that should be referred to me? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Sure, let's send it over to Alan. Should we so, put it on the agenda for items referred to be referred to city solicitor? I think um, not yet referred. It next should time? be referred to our city solicitor. Let's, 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 we could put it on, but, but it has to be seen by Alan. Oh, us. Okay, I'll definitely forward it to email her if Jim doesn't. Yeah, I just well, I already have it. I have it. Okay. Yeah, Jim sends it to me as well. Okay. Yeah, I he's looking at it, but I want to officially wait on it so we can all meet and discuss it. We're not doing it at the end of a meeting. Okay. Would it be would the committee like me to have reviewed it by next meeting so that I can give you my yes my thoughts? I would on appreciate it. it. Okay, I'll do that. Yes, I would okay. appreciate that. So that'll be on the next agenda as well. Moving on. Next is a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Laura roll call. Aye. Sure. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. Member Napolitano. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you all. Bye. Good night.